Good evening. My name is Rebecca Randall, and I've been asked to share a reflection with you this evening. When I sat down to prepare this talk, I couldn't help but remember the last time I offered a reflection at a Celtic spirituality night at the cathedral. It was January, almost a year ago, a time that looked and felt very, very different. A time when many of us felt so hopeful about the new year and about the new decade and couldn't possibly have anticipated what was to come. It has been a long and difficult year. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling very fatigued. As I write, my family and I are in quarantine as my youngest son was earlier last week exposed to COVID-19. We're experiencing the sadness that comes from having to be separated from loved ones and friends at this important time of year and being separated from cherished activities that bring meaning and sustenance to our days. And as is true for any experience of sadness or pain, platitudes of the be grateful for what you do have variety are usually not very helpful. And for all the potentialities that the virtual world promises, you can't convince me that it can satisfactorily replicate the experience of looking into the real eyes or sharing in a warm embrace of a friend or loved one. It can never provide me with the same sustenance and joy I feel when I physically sit in a candlelit cathedral with its smells and its sounds among friends and strangers connected by our shared desire for healing and love. This Sunday, we begin the Advent season, and I find myself believing that God is inviting us to know more deeply what it means to wait. I wish I could say that my fatigue stemmed from pandemic living alone, but that's not the case. At the beginning of this month, we awaited the results of the most brutally contested election of at least my lifetime the results of which remain contested by many even today. I feel exhausted by the ever sharpening divisions among us. I felt it viscerally in traveling from my neighborhood where I saw a sign celebrating Joe Biden's victory, which read, ding dong, the witch is dead. To our getaway home in PA, where I saw a sign decrying a stolen election and the end of the free world. In a recent article in The New Yorker, author, author Evan Osnos cited a paper presented by two political scientists at a conference. They found that 15% of Republicans and 20% of Democrats believed that the U.S. would be better off if large numbers of the opposing party just died. As some of you know, I work as a mental health professional. I recently attended a panel for fellow practitioners focused on how we can best navigate values conflicts experienced by our clients, ourselves, or even within ourselves. A panelist shared his experience of treating two people in the same day. One was a Black Lives Matter protester who felt fatigued from witnessing pr police brutality. And he struggled with the decision to march even though it meant potentially jeopardizing his own and his family's health. In the same day, he treated a police officer in extreme distress, feeling that in spite of his personal commitment to the public good, the world had turned against him and was set on maligning him. Our dividedness is apparent, but so is the toll that it's taking on all of us. When asked what strategies counselors could offer their clients when struggling with these values conflicts, the panelists noted a principle from social psychology. According to the principle of charity, he said, it is statistically unlikely that those who espouse beliefs and values radically different from our own intend us any direct personal harm. So one good strategy is to assume their good intentions. I, a mental health practitioner, appreciate deeply the insights of social psychology, but I often find that they only confirm what our 2000 year tradition has espoused and encouraged all along. Now more than ever, 
we who call ourselves followers of Jesus must recommit ourselves to the reconciling work of the God made present in him. For me personally, this means ongoing engagement in work for and towards a more just world. But more fundamentally, more practically, it means remembering and embracing each and every person as a neighbor who is worthy of understanding and respect, a guest worthy of welcome. The cultivation of the hospitality of the heart an attitudinal openness and welcome of the other is a distinctive and central strand of the Celtic spiritual tradition in particular. In the Gospel of John, Jesus prays that, quote, they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be one in us. The evangelist recalled Jesus' prayer as the first century was nearing its close when Jesus' disciples were further removed from his life and began to interpret the meaning and implications of his life in radically different ways. Communities of disciples then experienced great division, not unlike those we're experiencing in our communities today. It was this in this context that Jesus's prayer for unity was so central, so important, so necessary. While it may be true that the evangelist's concern was the Christian community, we have every reason to see Jesus's view as more expansive, encompassing the entire human community. And by oneness and unity, he didn't mean a fusion or erasure of difference. Rather, he pointed towards connection and difference, mirroring God's own trans Trinitarian being, a community of persons united in self-giving love. Hospitality of the heart may seem a simplistic message in these difficult and complex times, but I believe it's a radical message that has yet to be fully realized or fully embraced. Tonight, I've shared with you my fatigue, but I also share my desire and my prayer that we may be strengthened in these unprecedented times, that we may wait with hope, and that we may turn towards one another with open hearts, brimming with love.